Hi, it's Benjamin Douglas Ray with another edition of Sustainable Cannabis TV. This episode is brought to you by BuzzFeed, LinkedIn for Leaders Online and 8 Saints Brand. The URLs are just down at the bottom here. Check them out. So today I'm here with Tahir Johnson. He's with NCIA and he is the Business Development and Equ Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Manager there at NCIA. Boy, that was a mouthful. How are you doing today? I'm good, Benjamin. How about you? <laughs> doing excellent. Thanks. Yeah, that's a, that's a mouthful title, but it's a very important one. So I want to make sure people understand what you're doing. So tell us a lot about or tell us about, you know, what your background is, where you went to school, how you got into cannabis and really what your charge there is at NCIA. Sure, absolutely. So first, it's a pleasure to be here, especially um, this is my first LinkedIn live show. And LinkedIn has always been like one of my favorite social media platforms for a number of years now. So it's definitely a pleasure to share my story, talk a little bit about um, what I'm doing. Um, so as, as was introduced, my name is Tahir Johnson. I currently serve as the head of diversity, equity and inclusion at the National Cannabis Industry Association, as well as working in our membership department. Um, I am an alum of the illustrious Howard University here in Washington, D.C. Um, I was actually born and raised in Trenton, New Jersey. And uh, when I went to Howard, I ended up staying in the DMV area afterwards. Um, so after college, um, I ended up working in financial services, um, spent some time in insurance and banking, um, but spent the bulk of my career in wealth management, um, managing investments and, and doing financial planning for um, you know, wealthy families and uh, different types of clients, um, but also with a big focus on financial literacy. Mm -hmm. um, the first thing that made me get into finance in the first place was because, um, you know, coming from a family where I saw people um, make all types of financial mistakes and not really understanding money um, and knowing that um, it was so important for people of color to have access to financial information. You know, again, that made me get into finance. Um, when I found out about the cannabis industry, a couple things happened. Um, first, I read about Hope Wiseman, who's one of my good friends, um, but she's the youngest black woman in the country to own a dispensary. Mm. Um, she actually had a background in investment banking. So she was an investment banker for um, SunTrust, the same place where I was an investment advisor before coming into the industry. So that was one of the first things that inspired me and kind of showed me that there was a, you know, a path to get in. Mm -hmm. um, you know, backing up a little bit, when I was um, when I was at Morgan Stanley, I started in 2013. So same year that GW Pharma, um, you know, went public. So that was my first inkling that the cannabis, that cannabis was really an industry, right? Like seeing pharma come into it. And my, look how that's fast forwarded today, right? Like with them right. acquired. Um, so that really was the first thing that showed me, you know, I, I had been around cannabis all the time. I had consumed since high school. But that was the first thing that it told me that it, it this was like a, something different. This wasn't a new industry or like what me and my friends were doing, um, you know, anytime we we're selling a little bit of weed. Um, so, you know, looked at the cannabis industry. Um, and also at the same time, my dad was diagnosed with fibromyalgia. Um, mm -hmm. So it was a, you know, nerve pain and different types of conditions like that. And I was a person in college that was, you know, I know everybody has the, the student in class that does their reports on cannabis because they're that type of pothead. <laughs> Um, so I did one and, and when my dad got this, to, you know, got the disease, I was like, hey, dad, I think you can use medical cannabis to, to help you with this. And he says, son, you know, I, I smoke weed since the 60s. You know, it's, you can't tell me anything about this. And I'm like, no, <laughs> now, I really think you should try it. Um, and so I told him that I would get my medical card with him um, in order to encourage him to get it. And that really started me off to learning about, um, you know, medical cannabis and really just getting so consumed and, and learning about the benefits and how it could help people because I had somebody close to home um, for me that was, you know, that was dealing with it. So I started working at a dispensary here in Maryland as a patient advisor um, and running their social media accounts. Um, and I was doing that on the weekend. So working seven days a week, you know, Monday through Friday, still in the bank managing people's money, but on the weekends secretly being a bud tender. Um, <laughs> and I got in love with it so much um, and Maryland was actually, um, at the same time in 2019, Maryland opened up applications for cultivation and processing licenses um, that were preferential for um, minorities, African-Americans or Native Americans with a net worth in less than 1.7 million. So 
you know, I, I saw this, you know, as all these things were happening, you know, kind of falling in love with cannabis, I saw this as my opportunity to get into the industry. So I quit my job in finance, started working at the dispensary full time. Um, at that time, you know, I was kind of trying to trying to learn everything I could about the business and networking. Um, and at the Minority Cannabis Business Association's Lobby Day, I met my good friend Calico Castile, who is the head of growth at NCIA. Mm -hmm. um, I had a lot of relationships because I came with finance, but I, I never really knew anything about lobbying. Um, so as we were getting ready to lobby, I look at the sheet and I say, hey, if, if one of my boys is the chief of staff or one of these congressmen, should I hit him up? And he looks at me and is like, should I hit him up? Like, <laughs> you do. Um, so that was like my first introduction to lobbying and hence my um, introduction to NCIA and, and being here and the rest is really history. Uh, that's, that's a great background and good intro into. Thank you. So let's talk about social equity. You know, I know it's a, a, a important topic and uh, tell us what you're what you're doing in that respect. Sure. So at, at the National Cannabis Industry Association last year, I actually had the opportunity to um, launch and create our diversity, equity and inclusion initiatives. A big part of that was our social equity scholarship program. And with the social equity scholarship program, we've been able to extend complimentary membership to um, over 100, actually 110 social equity operators and applicants around the country so hmm. far. So we've got folks from coast to coast, from, from Massachusetts over to California and, and places in between where they have social equity programs. For me, um, it was so important because as somebody that actually came from those communities and you know also had been an entrepreneur pursuing the industry, I knew how that barrier to entry to the organization um, was really something that could um, that could unintentionally, you know, keep people that would be great people to be in this organization out. Right. Mm -hmm. um, the, 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 the most, the least expensive membership that we have is a thousand dollars per year. And as I was traveling the country over the first year that I was here, I would have a lot of conversations with social equity folks or minority entrepreneurs that would say, you know, I would talk to them about, Hey, why don't you join NCIA? And, you know, they didn't necessarily have the thousand bucks or more to be able to join. Uh, but I knew that there were so many great resources here, so much great information, so many great people. So as I was thinking of ways of how we could impact social equity, um, came up with this social equity scholarship program. It's really been great, man. There's been some amazing webinars from um, uh, like all regulators kind of sharing their insight to, to people from some of the top data firms in cannabis. So the one that we did yesterday was one of my favorite with all black men that are some of the best cultivators in the country. Um, and, you know, social equity, um, I've had the opportunity to work on policy on a national state level, um, really a lot in my home state of New Jersey over the, you know, November through leading up to the current legalization in some other places. So it's really been great to kind of, you know, for me personally, to be able to use my knowledge and something that I'm passionate about to be able to um, to push this agenda. And for me, I think the, the main thing is, right, there's less than there's less than four um, percent my African-American black and brown ownership of cannabis businesses in the entire country. At the same time, black people are almost four times, let's just say three point six times is likely to be arrested for cannabis. Hmm. Um, now, throwing some other numbers out there for again, right, the cannabis industry is projected to be worth 40 bill to double to be worth 40 billion dollars in the next five years. Just did 20 million dollars in the U.S. alone in annual revenue last year. Right. So how is it that people that come from these same communities that have been traditionally um, prosecuted for cannabis don't have an opportunity to participate? Um, and then at the same time, those same communities that have been ravaged, seeing people taken away, um, you know, so many things, even if they don't want to be in the cannabis industry, I think it's important that the money and funds from, um, you know, legalization also flow back there. And that, you know, that's a that's a big part of the conversation as well. So when we talk about social equity, it really is a two part thing. There's the social justice aspect of it. And that means people that are in prison for cannabis, um, people that have charges for cannabis, people that are still on probation for cannabis, you know, all those things that have their records clean, that prisoners get to come home. The other part of it is the economic justice aspect of it. And that just means equity and people actually getting a piece of this um, multi-billion dollar industry. So if it's 4% uh, ownership now, what's going to change that? I mean, what do you see would be, would, would be major milestones and massive action to be able to to affect that in a big way over the next 
five to ten years? Yeah, I think some of the some of the things that we can do are for one, support minority entrepreneurs that are in the cannabis space, right? I think there are so many studies that come from corporate America. And again, this is where like that background in, um, you know, my, my first experience with diversity was serving on the, the diversity council at Morgan Stanley. So I got to see the value of that corporate diversity and how it can um, really impact things. So so I'm going to talk about a couple different things. For one, I think that it's important to have people of color and diversity at all levels. And that includes ownership, um, you know, actually investment and employment. So that means that multi-state operators, there's no reason that they shouldn't have minorities, people of color, women, um, you know, on their boards of directors and the C-suite. That's a problem that's not only in corporate America, um, but it shouldn't be one in cannabis as well. Um, right. When we talk about investment, um, you know, for me, right, like my, my one of my biggest plays and things that I did was actually investing and in getting a license. Although most people know me for advocacy, having the opportunity to do that. Um, is really something that can create generational wealth. Um, and then when we talk about ownership, right? Like I think that we can support some of these black owned cannabis brands because they're going to support um, their people. They're going to hire black women are going to hire women, you know, you, the same thing. So like Wanda James, for example, my big mm -hmm. homie, shout out to Wanda, love you. Yeah. And she just announced her, you know, that she's franchising Simply Pure. Right. Um, you know, we can support that, get behind that. Let's have, let's take that brand and have her support that and grow that. Entrepreneurs, some of my best friends, like, like Hope, who I mentioned, Mary and Maine here, my dog, Selena Data G, man, we got to support the, we have to support the existing black businesses. It's not, if, if we decide to come into the game, Maybe we don't need to create our own, you know, maybe we can franchise one of theirs and use their resources and everything that they've learned. But then also, again, those existing black businesses, I think a lot of us coming together. Um, we're in the industry. We're certainly seeing a lot of consolidation amongst our counterparts, a lot of money coming into the industry. Um, and maybe as, as, as these black businesses can connect and grow stronger together, um, you know, I think that that'll have an impact on the industry as well. Yeah. About time. Right. I mean, you know, so keep up the efforts, keep doing what you're doing. It's good, good stuff. And a comment here from Justin, uh, big, big respect for Tier and what he's doing at NCIA, Justin Johnson, Bud's feet. Justin was good, man. Good to see you, bro. One of my LinkedIn homies. <laughs> my cousin, uh, well, let's, Johnson's. <laughs> let's talk about uh, this uh, sustainability at NCIA. I saw a white paper uh, that was up on the website. So Tell the viewers and listeners what's going on with that and, and uh, explain a little bit. Absolutely. So, yes, NCI just recently released a white paper on sustainability. Um, now, I won't claim to be I claim to be an expert in a lot of things, but I won't sit here and lie to you and say I'm a sustainability expert. But really, when we think about cannabis, we have to I think it's important to think of our um, footprint on the environment. Right. When we talk about cannabis, there's water. Um, depending what types of practices of how you grow cannabis can it can impact the land. Um, we have people growing in indoors in a lot of places, and that certainly takes energy and impacts the environment. Um, packaging, right? There, there's a big impact yeah. there. You know, is it non-recyclable plastics and all these different things? So I think with what the the goal of the white paper is really to explore all of these different things and set some options and best practices that people in the industry are doing so that this can be standardized. Um, because as, as this happens, I think, again, as the cannabis industry, there's a lot of places and ways where we can um, be different. So um, I think with us focusing on sustainability, for one, um, if for one, it's, a, it's good for the environment and it's also, you know, good for business as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Got a, a question here uh, from Robert. Isn't social equity support to extend to people adversely affected by the drug war, not just minorities. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. And, it, you know, and I think and I'm not sure where you came in, but what I said in the in the in the beginning is people who've been victims of the war on drugs. There's there's no color to being a victim of the war on drugs. I, I mean, I have white friends that have been arrested for cannabis. Um, it just so happens that when we talk about these communities, um, it, it's no secret that it is by and large. I mean, mostly impacting people of color, right? The statistics and data show you that. But I think it is is all people that have been impacted by the war on drugs. It's certainly not a not a color thing. If you're from one of these communities, um, you know, where you've been impacted, you you've been arrested, your family members have been arrested. Um, just just the the feeling of having to, I mean, live in a community, right? Where you go outside, you 
you, I know that pressure of being like, I'm going to be pulled over by the police. And that's not a, that's not a color thing. Um, again, it's about those communities. Again, they just happen to largely um, historically be communities of color that have been impacted the most. Yeah, and I wanted to add to that. Your, you said a statistic about the incarceration is, what'd you say, 60% or something like that? Yeah, African-Americans, according to the, the data that ACLU put out nationally, um, last year, African-Americans are, are na the national average is about is 3.6 times more likely to be arrested, although using counter using cannabis at the same um, rate is, as Caucasians. And in some places, in some places around the country, it was actually 20 times higher. Um, you know what I mean? So 3.6 is an average. Again, it's, it's a problem that affects anybody. Um, but I think specifically, I think it's unignorable to say that it's something that's largely impacted, um, you know, communities of color. Yeah, I mean the the data. You know, we've got we've got years of data to support that. So right, and even if you look at historically, you know, if we go take it all the way back, you know, even before Nixon, right? We talk about the early days of this country and the whole cannabis versus marijuana paradox. Yeah, it was you know reefer madness, and you know it makes darkies think they're as good as white men. The whole um, the whole stigma and somewhat even criminalization of cannabis in the first place in this country was rooted in that. And I think that it's important that we have to acknowledge that history, along with making sure that there's restorative and reparative justice for, again, for everybody along the way. Yeah. Good. Well, let's talk about federal legalization. You know, uh, Michael Patterson and I talked about it a few days ago, and, and it's on everyone's mind, you know. And so I'd love to know, um, you know, NCIA's position and, and your position on it, or at least opinion on it, about, I'm just going to leave it there, federal legalization. It's a hot topic right now. Yeah. And shout out to my guy, Michael Patterson. It's, I can't believe I have to follow him up talking about policy, <laughs> man. That's who I call when I need to know something. That's right. Um, and uh, of course, um, you know, I'll say, I'll say my opinion. I'm, I'm not in our government relations department, but um, you know, Mike and Michelle, they they definitely have been doing some great work and they've actually been actively involved in some of the, the more recent conversations around federal legalization. Look, I think when we talk about federal legalization at this point, this is no longer a, a if conversation, but it's a, a when. If you ask me, I'm super bullish on it. I think it's going to be sooner or later. Like I wouldn't personally be surprised if cannabis got legalized this year or next year. No, I'm mm. not going to say that's NCIA's position. Um, but if you look at it, of course, right, politically, um, the Gallup polls that we saw in November said that 68 percent of Americans were in support of legalization. Um, we have Kamala Harris, who was one of the sponsors of the Moore Act as the vice president. Um, things have shifted where Democrats have 50 percent of the Senate, um, you know, and we're coming off of seeing where safe banking was included in the coronavirus relief bills multiple times. Um, mm -hmm. so as like, you know, so we see the momentum on safe banking. I certainly think that that's going to pass, right? Historically, the first standalone cannabis bill to pass in the House um, just in 2019. Um, and the other part is cannabis haven't been essential. And every ultimately in every market where there was a legal cannabis market, there were some that started out in the beginning, I think like one or two where it wasn't but cannabis was essential in every place where there was a legal market. Um, they've seen the momentum where the states are moving towards legalization. There's absolutely a need for people to get this tax revenue. So, you know, safe banking. And, and last year we saw where the MORE Act to decriminalize move forward. Um, I know Biden hasn't quite gotten right there. He's been, you know, he's been vocal about that leading into the presidency. But I think that, you know, where we can change. And of course, it seems like he's more open to medical and possibly rescheduling. Mm -hmm. um, but recently, you know, just in recent weeks, we've seen where in the Senate, um, where Schumer, um, Booker and Wyden just pronounced just announced a new cannabis bill that that will be more comprehensive and actually focus on true legalization and social equity. And one of the reasons that's important is because, um, you know, before, like the more act lacked the regular regulatory structure and by them take moving towards a more advanced bill. I mean, look, we had the Speaker of the House, um, you know, announcing a cannabis bill. If that doesn't say something, um, then I don't know what does. Yeah, I mean, it's I mean, the leader of the Senate, excuse me, not Speaker of the House. Yeah, yeah it's uh, it's changing rapidly. I mean, probably faster than most people in this industry thought. And I think we're going to see some real movement, as you said, over the next year or two and certainly in the next four years, I imagine. You know, once we get through kind of coronavirus stimulus package, 
it's it, it could be you know one of the things on the top agenda of the agenda mainly because you know like you said the tax revenue and the incarceration rate i mean there's a lot wrapped up in that but once it is legalized a lot of things are going to change and we can see in the communities or states where it has been big things have changed in terms of money coming in for schools you know like here in colorado we actually had more money than we collected or, or we had more money then went to the schools that was uh you know offered so it was there was a question do you want your money back from these tax revenues which rarely happens so you know what i see is that it's either it's either going to go that way or it's going to go back into the black market which nobody nobody at all wants um so it's happening i think relatively quickly here right i agree the um you know what do you what do you see as some other major initiatives that ncia is working on or would like to work on here over the next year or two? Um, well, some of the, I'll say one of the um, major things that NCI is working on um, is expanding our memberships to, we're offering a new membership tier um, to be able to um, fit some of the needs of some of our other members. And really I'll say over the next year, hopefully being able to get back to conferences. Um, last year, um, COVID shut down the Cannabis Business Summit, which is our um, kind of main conference. It's a 10,000 person conference that was supposed to be in the Moscone Center in San Francisco. So hopefully over the next year, um, if the world opens back up, you know, everybody gets vaccinated, conferences will be, um, you know, a part of the part of the conversation next year. And I think that'll be really big for NCI. Uh, what have you guys done kind of online in terms of keeping up with that community? Uh, you know, you can't go to conferences. So what, how have you kept in touch for your biz dev? Um, I know you do videos and you're, you're on LinkedIn quite a bit. What, what else uh, is NCI going to, to keep that going? Yeah, well, you know, one of the things that, that was super cool to be a part of, you know, over the last year was, was helping to shift our culture from, you know, in-person events to digital events. Um, big shout out to our events team, um, Brooke and Brian Gilbert, you know, they started um, doing the like our, they started a webinar series, mm -hmm. um, our our um, our industry socials um, and cannabis caucuses that were typically in-person events. Like we had 30 on the calendar to do in person last year. We shifted it and did, I'll say, about 75 percent of those all digitally. Um, so, you know, one of the things was that we were already positioned and had some of these digital properties. So it wasn't as tough for us to hit the switch and do it. Um, and then me personally. I'll say I'm a student of Gary V. Um, so like I'm always looking at ways to create content and, you know, how can I take one thing and put it on multiple platforms? Um, and it's just something I've always loved to do. Even when I was in finance, you know, I was I've always been in marketing. I was a marketing major. So, you know, I love making videos. Um, I created a podcast called the Cannabis Diversity Report. Um, I have listeners. I just started it in June and I have listeners in 29 countries. Wow. Um, and it's just been fun, man, doing webinars focused on social equity. Um, like you said, I love using LinkedIn and, and Instagram and other social platforms. And I just got on a new one clubhouse yesterday. So I'm, I'm looking forward to, you know, spreading some stuff there too. What, uh, what do you think about clubhouse and the opportunity for the cannabis industry? Oh, yeah, it's dope. I mean, I saw as soon as I got in there, I saw so many, um, you know, so many people. But I think one of the things it does is decentralize um, information. And I think that that's a game changer. Sometimes some of these conversations that I'm having or like the industry folks are having, you know, privately, now they can happen in a public stage in a way that other people can learn from. So like even me, for example, like I have the podcast and you know, I have a bunch of listeners like all over, but you it's kind of a niche thing, right? Most of you're not in the industry or like a tuned in to that or like industry folks and you probably don't know about it. Clubhouse is something that's open and access to everybody. So like once you get on there, you can put stuff out and everybody can can kind of get on it. So I'm looking forward to that. Do you think that uh, Vladimir Putin's going to accept Elon Musk's invitation to talk openly? Hey, man, I don't know. He should. I mean, Elon Musk is is my guy, man. I love everything he does. Like, he's he's a genius. Like, if some of the stuff y'all might look at it and, and sound, you think it sounds crazy. But I, I've been bullish on Tesla from the beginning. It's so crazy that you say Elon Musk. Like, when I started working at Morgan Stanley, again, it was 2013. 
Um, and it was around the same same year that Tesla, um, you know, had that IPO. And as a young person, as soon as I saw, like even found out about Tesla, I was like electric. I was like, this is going to be the greatest stock in the world. Mm. Um, and mind you, I was most of the other financial advisors were like 30, you know, 20 years my senior. So they didn't see it. Everybody yeah. was, like, well, you know, electric cars aren't going to be this is not going to make sense. And then almost like a couple months later, I had his first spike. And now, oh, my gosh, like like I said, I'm, I'm bullish on Tesla. Um, but yeah, like I said, Elon Musk, you know, I, I believe in what he does and, um, yeah, I, but, but I wonder when he's going to decide to set his sights on the cannabis industry. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I mean, that, that could be a conversation. Why don't you ask Elon to have a conversation on clubhouse and talk to him about that? Hey, well, yeah, maybe he'll see our LinkedIn live here or maybe I can get him on clubhouse. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you go. Well, that, that's, uh, this is all great stuff. It looks like you're, uh, you're busy. In a good way, you got a lot of uh, runway here to do some good stuff. Thanks for being on the show. Absolutely. It's, it's definitely a pleasure to be here. I always enjoy sharing my story, um, especially for me. It's a, a bittersweet time. I'm actually in the um, in the process of transitioning out of NCIA, um, and I'm going to have a bunch of other cool projects that I'm working on, still focused on social equity, but also hoping to be able to use my financial background a little bit to be able to empower communities um, all some of the stuff I love doing, like music business and, and so many other things are finally coming together. So I'm looking at I'm looking forward to the opportunity to kind of the next level and be able to continue to be an asset to the cannabis community. Got a, a comment here. Thank you for that. I got I got a comment here uh, again from Robert talking about Elon Musk, that he smokes weed. Yeah. Uh, eats mushrooms too. go Elon. So that's yeah, right, oh, that'd be an interesting conversation right on. Yeah, I have I have a T-shirt with um that picture of him with Joe. I made a T-shirt of that picture of him um smoking um with Joe Rogan. So I, I'm I'm definitely a big fan of that. <laughs> good. All right. So how can people get a hold of you? So you know, for the listeners out there, uh, if they want to listen to your podcast, uh, website, uh, email, what? Uh, how can people get a hold of you? Absolutely. So I'm super active on LinkedIn. Um, I generally try to respond and get to everybody that reaches out to me. Um, it's just my name, Tahir Johnson, T-A-H-I-R-J-O-H-N-S-O-N. Um, same thing on Facebook, Tahir Johnson. Um, everything, everywhere else, I'm Ty Diddy. That's T-A-H-D-I-D-D-Y. Um, that's Ty Diddy on Instagram, Twitter, and Nail Clubhouse. Um, and you can email me, as a matter of fact, just email me at my personal email address right now. Um, for the next couple of weeks, you can still reach me at Tahir at the cannabis industry dot org. But you can also email me at toddiddy at gmail.com. Oh, great stuff. Thanks for being on the show. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks for having me again, Benjamin. All right. We'll talk to you soon. Yep. Bye.